Welcome to Montgomery Talks, our regular podcast on uh, Montgomery County issues. I'm Doug Tolman, senior reporter at Montgomery Community Media. And my guest today is Andrew Friedson, freshman member of the Montgomery County Council. He represents District 1, the Potomac River District, if you will, which ranges from the Tony neighborhoods of Bethesda to the bucolic hills of Poolsville. That may well be the most diverse district in terms of geography, at least, in the county. Welcome, Mr. Friedson. Thank you. Glad to be here. And that was the most interesting description of the district I've heard to date, so I appreciate that. The bucolic hills, I like that. Pools was a lovely community. It is. So I think the first thing we have to talk about today is the news of yesterday about Tanya Chapman, her decision to remove her name for consideration as chief of police. What are your thoughts? Well, I heard the news largely when others did. We were notified yesterday morning and and were told that she had withdrawn her name from consideration. I totally respect her decision. We uh, were uh, in the process of doing the vetting that I think is expected of us from county residents. And she made the decision that she did, respect the decision that she made, and now we're going to have to move forward and make sure that we have a police chief leading a department that is critical to our public safety and our quality of life in Montgomery County. Had you met with her? I had. What did you think of her? I enjoyed meeting with her. We had a very good, frank discussion. I learned about her background, her vision for uh, what she wanted to do. And that was part of the broader process of vetting of candidates that we do for all major appointments. Could you see yourself voting for her? We hadn't gotten to that point. Uh, we had a you know series of questions as part of the regular process that uh, we were uh, looking through. We were doing research on our own. We were uh, waiting to hear back on uh, certain questions that we had. I wasn't at the point of making that consideration of whether or not I would vote and how I would vote. But you know, we obviously didn't get to that point. Okay, because one of the things I had heard yesterday was there may have been some thought that she wouldn't have gotten five votes. Do you think that's a fair assessment, or do you think it's premature? I think it's premature. I wasn't in the situation of counting votes. I think, you know, the county executive, certainly when he has appointments, that's you know, part of his role to determine what the likelihood of getting his nominees through and what those nominees uh, would need in order to get the support of the council. Uh, my job is really just to make sure that I'm vetting the candidates as the elected representative of the constituents who I represent on the council and making sure that I'm comfortable with that person in the role. And the role police chief is among the most important positions that we appoint in county government. How would you assess this appointment um, or this attempted appointment? I mean, is this, is this a uh, is the Elrich administration botch it or is this just a um, course of doing business every now and then an, an appointment doesn't work? Well, I think it is true that every now and then an appointment doesn't work, but I think we're all disappointed in the process. I think that the process could have been better. There were a number of leaks to the media. We learned about this appointment from the press. Uh, which is not the way that it's supposed to work. I don't think that did justice to the council. I don't think that did justice to the county uh, or to the county executive. And it certainly, I don't think, did justice to the nominee. It was not our best moment as a county. And I think that we all need to be honest about that. I think we need to take that to heart. And uh, this isn't about blaming the executive or the administration or any individual who participated in this process. It's about recognizing the fact that these are serious responsibilities that we all bear in public life. And we need to take those responsibilities seriously and make sure that we're doing the people's work in a responsible way, in an appropriate way. And I don't think that this process to date reflected that. Speaking of leaks, one of the names that has emerged as a potential replacement for Chapman, not from the Elrich administration, but from elsewhere, has been Daryl McSwain, former assistant chief. Have you heard that? What are your thoughts? I'm not aware of any decision of where the administration is looking to move to come up with an alternative to their preferred candidate for this decision. This just happened uh, yesterday, broken by uh, the talents right here in this room, not named me. So congratulations on uh, a scoop that you got. You knew it before I did, I believe. But I would just say, you know, I have a lot of respect for Daryl McSwain. I think he has a lot of respect from folks in county government. I have no idea what the county executive uh, chooses to do and, and, and what direction he will decide to go in. But I think he's done an admirable job at the park police. And I think that he has a you know, long and respected career in county government as uh, Montgomery County Police. Just one more thing on Daryl McSwain, uh, just an observation. I wonder if you could share your thoughts on it. McSwain left the police department in May of 2018, if I'm not mistaken, 
which means he left one month before the Robert White killing. Elrich has said over and over again that he wants a change agent as a police chief because of the Let Act, because of other, because of what the public wants. It seems odd that somebody who is so recently a member of the police department would be considered, would check the, the, those boxes, would be the change agent that Elrich wants. But curiously, he did leave a month before probably the biggest police scandal that Montgomery County's had at least in the last five, ten years. Your thoughts? Well, I can't speak to what the county executive is looking for in terms of his public statements about wanting a change agent. I understand the need to make changes. I don't know that those from within the department or who have worked in the department can't be change agents. And as somebody who has gone into state agencies as an outsider and as an insider and made significant changes, I don't think that there's one or the other. I think you're either a person who believes in change or you're a person who doesn't believe in change. And that's not necessarily reflected in the question of whether you have come up through the organization or not, or whether you have worked previously at the organization or not. That said, my goal is not necessarily to find a change agent, and that's not my job to find a candidate. Mm -hmm. That's county executives, and I will leave that to him. Mm -hmm. My only responsibility here, and I take it very seriously, is to make sure that whoever is nominated, for them to be appointed, that they have the credentials, the experience, the ability to lead a department of 1,300 officers who are looking out for the best interests and public safety of 1.1 million residents. And that is my standard. That will always be my standard. And I will make sure that whoever is put forward by the county executive gets that type of consideration and has that type of vetting to make sure that that's the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one last question. Do you think Elrich did right by Tanya Chapman? I think the process was not helpful to her and I don't think was a great circumstance for her or for the county, as I mentioned. I I think we did not do right by anybody involved in this. And I wish her nothing but the best in her career and in her life. And, you know, I think there were some unfortunate uh, circumstances for her. And I think there were some unfortunate circumstances for the county as a whole. And it didn't reflect on any of us particularly well. That's why I think we need to improve it moving forward because you know, I don't think anybody deserves to be caught up in a process that was as challenged as the process that we just saw with the police chief search. I want to move on to something at least a little bit more in your wheelhouse. Before you were on the council, you were a part of the Maryland Comptroller's Office. And uh, on your campaign website, you tout the fact that you restructured the program that parents use to save money for their kids' college education, the 529 program. And you ran on improving the way government works. At least three of the pieces of legislation that you've put forth in the last, since you've t- taken office nine months ago, have been in that subject area. And so I'm going to do something that's pretty dangerous because I'm kind of a government geek, as a, and so I, I may go off the rails on this, so, but I'm going to try to at least keep this uh, as interesting to other people as possible. Um, this may be difficult. Happy to geek out with you. Yeah. The council has recently passed a bill that would strengthen the requirements for each piece of legislation would get a fiscal impact study, um, spelling out how new policies would affect the pocketbooks of residents and businesses. It had those kinds of rules in place before. These aren't necessarily new rules, but you have put forth what to make them stronger? Yes, exactly. So we have currently in all county legislation a fiscal impact statement and an economic impact statement. By and large, the fiscal impact statements do a pretty good job. That's done by the Office of Finance and that is, uh, excuse me, the Office of Management and Budget. And the Office of Management and Budget is determining what the impact on the county budget would be on revenues. And understandably, county government is very concerned about what the impacts on the county budget would be. And so those are done with a level of detail and seriousness that one would expect of these uh, impact studies. The economic impact study, I think, has left some wanting in terms of its level of specificity and the helpfulness of what the actual impact would be, not on the county budget, but on the budgets of Montgomery County residents and businesses. And to me, that's where the rubber meets the road because that's what determines how much money county government makes. This is based on how healthy an economy we have in Montgomery County. Everything is based off of that. That's what determines our quality of life. That's what determines the ability for us to keep up with the services that residents have come to expect. And so that is where we really needed help. And so what we've done is we've moved that over from the executive branch to the Office of Legislative Oversight. There's going to be a new professional economist who is going to oversee that process. And rather than making it something that could happen, often does happen, but not as helpful as we would like, it is required to happen. And we've specified 
know, what we would like in it. And by moving it into an independent place like the Office of Legislative Oversight that we have direct oversight over, you know, as a county council, by making it required of all county legislation going through the regular process, and by hiring an economist to do this specifically, we're going to make sure that the interests of nonprofits and of businesses in Montgomery County are considered in every legislation that we vote on at the county council. Okay. So to reject my built-in programming, I'm going to ask probably the, the question that I hope somebody for the last, if they've stuck with us for the last three minutes, why is any of this important? Well, I don't think that we should be making any decisions at the county council without the full breadth of understanding of the impact that it would have on residents and on businesses. That's what we're here for. Those are the folks who are paying not only our salaries, but for all the services that we provide and our ability to keep up with those services are solely based on how healthy the businesses are, how healthy the budgets and the bottom lines of our residents and families are. And unless we take those into consideration in every policy decision that we make, we're going to be in serious trouble. And so I think that this is a critically important aspect of what we're doing. It's something that I felt very strongly about when I took office, my top legislative priority for this year, because it's not about the individual policies that we do here and there, and those are important, but it's about what is the institutionalized way that we do policymaking and who is included and what is included and what are we considering in the policymaking process. And as we try to improve our business reputation, as we try to be more competitive in an increasingly competitive economy, there is nothing more important in that aspect, I think, than ensuring that in every policy decision that we make as a county council and in Montgomery County, that we're including the impact on residents, businesses, nonprofits. So uh, with your time in the comptroller's office, you're probably intimately aware of the, f the fiscal impact studies that the, that the General Assembly receives. Is that what you're hoping to see on that, uh, that level of, of detail on the, what you receive for each bill? Yes. I, I, the studies that are done at the state level have a fiscal note and a you know, small business impact in the same note. Ours are separate in the, in the county, but it's quite similar. And the Bureau of Revenue Estimates and the Department of Legislative Services work together on those uh, impact statements and I think do a very good job. And that is largely what this was based on, some of my experience and seeing how that process worked and seeing an opportunity that we can improve upon it in Montgomery County. You're also working on a bill that would uh, require the Inspector General to review each county budget, what, each budget like once every three years? So the bill was originally introduced as every three years. We were working on amendments that would make it regular and allow for some level of discretion to the inspector general of what that time frame is so that some of the larger budgets are more frequent and some of the smaller ones that have less potential concern would be a little bit less frequent and to allow for the resources to be used as efficiently as possible. I'm open to that and I have been willing to, to move forward with that. But the idea is a regular review of every county department. Department. Okay. The Inspector General's office is relatively small in the county office building, correct? Absolutely. It's too small. It's actually far too small, and I think it reflects the fact that we don't do nearly as good of a job as we could and as we should in terms of investing in oversight. And that's been a, a big focus of mine, not just on oversight as a county council member of asking the tough questions from the dais, but making sure that we have the resources to ensure that we are spending every taxpayer dollar efficiently, effectively, and appropriately. And that is what this is all about. We've compared to similar jurisdictions around the country. We, we spend far less uh, than other jurisdictions do. And we also, I think, should be doing oversight not just Inspector General waste, fraud, and abuse investigations, which we do a pretty good job of, by and large, with rare, unfortunate, extreme exceptions. But, but Peter we, Bang you're talking about, certainly. That is certainly an example and something that we, we need to, to, to do. But the problem is, is that those waste, fraud, and abuse circumstances are based off of generally tips. They're reactive. And what we need to do is a better job of proactive oversight. And currently, there's an admirable job that's done in the Office of Internal Audit, but that is outsourced. It is determined by the executive branch. And to me, that is one small piece, but it's not the full piece of what oversight is supposed to be. Oversight is a core responsibility of a legislative branch. We pass a budget. We provide oversight for that budget. That's the game. In the case of the county council, we happen to also do land use. But if we're not providing oversight for the money that we are allocating ourselves 
that we are directly overseeing, then we are missing you know, a key component of what we ought to be doing. And so that's what I've really tried to focus on here and hone in on here. And the bill that we've introduced that I've partnered with the council president and the council vice president, the three of us serve not only in the government operations and fiscal policy committee, but as the audit committee. And as the audit committee, we have introduced this bill together and I've been working very hard with them to get to a good place where we can move this bill forward. Now, there's no doubt that it's going to cost money. There is an investment that is required in order to provide the level of oversight that is needed for a $5.8 billion budget. But one, it would get us to closer to where other jurisdictions are that are similar in size and in scope to us. But number two, what it costs in public dollars pales in comparison what it makes up for in the increased public trust that we would be getting from residents by making sure that every one of the dollars that we're asking them to give to us to provide public services are being spent in a responsible and an appropriate way. We mentioned Peter Bang. For anyone who doesn't remember, he was the county economic uh, development official who I believe he faked a company managed to get it economic development funds that essentially got funneled into his own bank accounts. Am I summarizing that? Am I summarizing I think, that? I think that's a reasonable to, summary, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, he has been tried and convicted, and I believe he's now serving time. Yes, and now there's a question of how much of that money would be recoverable by the county, and there's a lot of hard work that's being done in that regard, but unfortunately, you know, we don't know how that is all going to end up. But we, we don't want to get there. The, the, the point of that is there are processes that can be done and checks on the processes that can potentially prevent situations from happening so that we're not just waiting until somebody tips off an inspector general or, unfortunately, in this case, nobody tipped off the inspector general. We actually found out because there was an IRS Mm -hmm. investigation and we got called by the feds. And the feds let us know of what was happening because he happened to be spending obscene amounts of money in gambling institutions. And they matched up his gambling to his income and his tax statements And those didn't match up. And that's where the fraud was detected. And that is way beyond what it can be. And I think, you know, we have to be honest about it. I'm not saying that we're going to catch everything. You know, this isn't the panacea solution to all problems. But the question is, are we doing enough to prevent these things from happening? Are we doing enough to make sure that we're doing things the right way? Are we doing enough to do the standard that I think everything should be done? Where can I talk to a Montgomery County taxpayer on the street and feel confident that we're doing everything that we can to safeguard their hard-earned dollars that they're paying in taxes? And I think the answer is we can do more. And that's what this bill is all about. You're also not too keen on the uh, county skimming money from retiree health benefits. You were the only uh, council member to object to that particular element of the current budget. I think not too keen is a good way to a good, good way to put it. It might be a slight understatement. I feel very passionately about it for a number of reasons. Number one, OPEB, which is the post-employment health care benefits for our retirees, that is a, a commitment that we have made to our retirees. That is not an option of whether or not we want to pay it. That is an obligation that we have made to those who have served in public life in Montgomery County. We got to pay it no matter what. Well, as a quick aside, yeah, sure. for years and years and years, that was pay as you go. For the longest time, it was uh, the, the accountants decided, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, said that it's not a smart idea. And that's what we're still dealing with. That is true. But the reality is GASB made that determination, GASB being the mm-hmm. uh, standard nationally for uh, public accounting standards. The reason for that is that we know how expensive it was getting. The cost of healthcare has skyrocketed. The benefits that we're providing are expensive. And the idea that we would be concerned only about the pension liabilities, the wage benefits that we have provided as a benefit in retirement and not the health care benefits when the wage benefits are easier to control, they're easier to understand, they're easier for actuaries to figure out based on life expectancy. Health care benefits because of how much health care has increased in costs was the hardest thing to control and, and became the, some of the biggest liabilities and the most volatile liabilities that governments were facing. And so that was, that was not a random decision made by the public accounting board. That was a very intentional decision made for the fiscal health of public institutions and governments. And this was one of the three main aspects of our fiscal plan. We focus a lot on debt. And we focus a lot on the 10% reserves. And to the credit of this current council and the previous council, they have done a very good job, and I think probably don't get as much credit as they deserve, in following those two legs of the stool. The problem is the third leg of the stool, based on the previous county executive and this county executive's decisions, 
the council has not stood up to those decisions in a way that I think it must. And so we have not followed that third leg of the stool. And the misunderstanding that I think people have is, you know, nobody understands what OPEB is. It's a very complicated idea that, you know, it's a long-term benefit. We're investing beforehand. They understand pensions. OPEB is a just, you know, four random letters that nobody has ever heard of. But the reality is it's far more expensive than debt. Debt is relatively cheap. We have a AAA bond rating. We borrow for inexpensive and it's controlled. We know exactly how much we owe. And yes, debt had gotten way too high in Montgomery County, still is too high in Montgomery County, but we're slowly bringing that down. It's still the third line item in the budget, public schools, public safety, paying off our debt service. I mean, that's not a healthy model to begin with, but it's controlled. In OPEB, the cost of that, we're, we're foregoing you know, 7%, give or take, of compounded interest. So simple interest is you know, 3% or less, you know, give or take, on debt. It's more than double that compounded, so it's exponentially larger than that, on diverting money from OPEB. That's, mixed, that's missed opportunity for investment returns that we will never get back. That's the equivalent of a family saying, well, we're just not going to save for t- retirement for a few years, and don't worry, we'll make up for it. Well, that family very quickly realizes that the missed time that they had not participating in the marketplace, not investing and saving for their retirement becomes extremely costly, almost unbearably costly down the road because you have to make up not just the returns, but the compounding of those returns over time. It's a short-sighted decision and it's the definition of unsustainable because it's a one-time savings for on- ongoing expenses. And it's not just this county executive. I don't want this to be, a, you know, he came in and made a decision. He made a tough call. I think it was the wrong call. But he made a tough call based on less money coming from the state than was expected. But it's a vicious cycle that we have gotten into and we've gotten way too comfortable with over the years. That isn't just the $89.6 million diversion that I voted against this year, which is the largest one we've had in recent memory. It's the $302.8 million of diversions over the past five years. And that $302.8 million is real money. And that real money has not been generating significant amounts of investment returns in the market. And that's what is extremely costly. And we're going to have to pay the money now or later. And it's just going to cost much more money later, either in taxpayer dollars or in cuts to services. And that's to me, is not acceptable. Let's talk about that. Are we looking at an austere budget coming up? Or is you got a recession coming that it's almost guaranteed that it's going to show up within just a couple of months? You've got these expenses that need to go through. Are we looking at layoffs? Are we looking at cutbacks in school uh, assistance? Are we looking at what? I don't know the answer. And I think that the bottom line is- But you've to be, contemplated we have the to. I certainly have contemplated it. And the, the bottom line is we have to be prepared for that. So the, the premise of this current budget that we're in that was proposed was drafted as a best case scenario, things are going to get better down the road. And I think the reality is that we can all understand now based on what's happening with the, with the markets- you know, and, and we've seen the, the bond curve turn, and that is a pretty significant precursor of what's to come for a likely recession, as you mentioned, at some point. And if we're not prepared for that likely downturn, that's a problem. And currently, the way that the budget is written, we aren't prepared for it, and we need to be prepared for it. And so we're, we're doing a lot of work uh, at the council. I have to give my council colleagues credit, though they did vote against or voted for the OPEB diversion you know, it, 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 differently than I did. Everybody shared concern with the decision. They just felt like they were being put in a really difficult situation by the county executive. And we got a commitment at that discussion for long-term structural changes. And we started that conversation before recess uh, over the summer, talking about changes to the fiscal plan. We're going to take up those discussions after we get out of recess in earnest this fall and try to make decisions based on the fiscal plan to focus ourselves on, on fiscal responsibility and making sure that we are you know, continuing the work that had been done and approve, uh, improving upon the areas that we have come short, like OPEB. And there are things that we can do. The, the problem with OPEB is that we wait till the end of the year. This is what happens. This is not a current service. This is a down-the-road responsibility, critically important to our fiscal health 
But there's no real constituency besides you know, a relatively small group of retirees. And besides me shouting from the mountaintops about the importance of OPEB, there's not a lot of folks who are showing up to the council fighting for it. Every other expense in the budget has a large constituency that's fighting for it, understandably. And I get that. And I appreciate that. And so what happens at the end of the year, because we have had to have savings plans, because we've had, I think, somewhat ambitious budgets that have expected things to get better quicker in the county uh, and have had other issues come up, like the tax changes and other things that have happened, you know, that have caused, you know, all kinds of volatility. At the end of the year, there's a shortfall. And what's the easiest thing to do in a shortfall? Rather than cut a budget that has employees, that has services that are being provided to residents, understandably, they're looking at cutting the one thing that there isn't really a constituency for that is going to fight back. And the problem is you do that once, in a really tough situation, you probably can get away with it. And you probably can then you know, fund, make up the funding the next year, just like missing a retirement investment. You, know, you can make up for one or two, a small amount. The problem is, is it becomes a vicious cycle at the end of the year. We keep doing this every year. And you keep doing it every year. A few million here, a few million there becomes 302.8 million and growing. And that 302.8 million is more than 302.8 million as mentioned because it's the lost investment returns mm-hmm. that we're missing out on the compounded interest that we're missing out on. And so that's when it gets extremely uh, expensive. And so what can we do? There, there are lots of things that we can do, but it can start with the county council can require quarterly payments into the OPEB trust fund. So we have a budget and say, this is how much money is supposed to go into OPEB this year. Rather than saying, wait till the end of the year, and if there's money left over, it's basically being used as a reserve account. And then if we're lucky enough to not need it, then we invest the balance into the OPEB trust fund. That's not the way it's supposed to work. It's there to be invested. And so it should be invested on a quarterly basis. Should there be some flexibility? Sure. I think you know fiscal responsibility also means being nimble and being able to adjust to realities in real time. But it doesn't mean that you should leave a pot of money that serves as a fund that is being used to pay for ongoing expenses in the budget right. for the following year you know, with a one-time savings that's only going to cost you down the road. But you have reserves that you can use and not that aren't OPEP. True. The, the challenge with that has been the council has been slowly building up to get to 10%. There are right. some who argue that's too high, some who argue it's right. too low, but that was the fiscal plan that was decided. And so there was an aversion historically to take away from the progress that was being made at getting to the 10% reserve as part of the fiscal right. plan. That was seen as sacred. Bringing down our debt was seen as sacred. I think that it, both of those are positives of right. you know real seriousness about the fiscal plan. The problem was the third piece was seen as anything but sacred, right. and that to me is the challenge. Now the question is, you know, we're looking at this as part of the fiscal plan. Is what should be in the reserves? What should those reserves be paying for? I'll give you a perfect example: weather-related incidents, snow removal. Every year, the county executive puts in a certain number. It gets cut a little bit. Everybody knows it's never enough to what we're likely to need. That money comes out of reserves and has to be funded the next year. It's effectively an accounting trick. And what we need to do is figure out a way to be more honest about it. I actually agreed with the executive that snow removal should have been higher in this previous prepared budget. And the challenge that we have is it's in the transportation budget. So he made significant cuts to major transportation routes that are a huge focus of the county, critical to our economic development, our quality of life. And there was this money sitting there that wasn't paying for any services as we were cutting for significant debt desperately needed transportation routes. And so some of that money was used to pay for it. I understand why it was done, but we need to not pit money we know we're going to need to spend against desperately needed services. We need to have a system that's set up in a better way that has better guardrails. Because of all the transportation metaphors, maybe this is an appropriate time to ask you about the pedestrian deaths that have taken place in the county a couple recently in your district. This county has been talking about Vision Zero for at least the first year of Ike Leggett's first administration. So we're going back at least 13 years that we've been talking about what an issue pedestrian safety has been. And yet we continue to see remarkable numbers of people being injured or or killed on our roads. What's the answer? Why can't the county at least make a dent in this problem? Well, first of all, we need to talk about this on a human level because it's not a policy issue. It's a people issue. Mm -hmm. And the two people who we lost recently within weeks of each other, Jay Castle went to my high school, Churchill High School, 17-year-old who was riding his bike to the pool on Old Georgetown Road, and Jennifer DeMauro, 31-year-old young woman who was looking to serve and to help people and was about to move to Boston, actually, to provide services to people in need. 
And these were two people who were not only young, but were just, by all accounts, incredible people who were beloved by their families, by their classmates and, and, and loved ones, and who wanted nothing more than to bring smile to people's faces and to provide for those who needed help around them. And to have lost them is such a tragedy and is such a huge miss on our public policy. And we need to talk about it in a people-focused way. And that's what the problem with our policy, is it isn't focused really on people. It's focused on, from a transportation perspective, on how quickly we can move cars and not on how safely we can move people. And that is a fundamentally flawed way of viewing a road. And we know that these roads are dangerous by design. They were designed a long time ago. In the case of Old Georgetown Road, we have an extremely small sidewalk that is way too close to the road many lanes to, to traverse in order to get across the road, too few crosswalks to be able to safely get by. And so it's, it's, a, huge, it's a huge issue. I've been focused on this since virtually the day I took office. The second full day in office, we did a downtown Bethesda walk, which you joined us mm -hmm. on, which I appreciate. As you know, that was focused almost exclusively on pedestrian safety. We looked at crosswalks. We looked at the protected sidewalks. We uh, had some wins. We fixed some pavers that were out of place. We cleared some sidewalks that needed to be cleared. We made sure that uh, areas adjacent to a construction site were open for uh, more parts of the day, which continues to be a focus of ours. But there were also some big ticket items that take longer. One of them actually was just recently finished. There was an uh, accessibility and safety issue at Old Georgetown Road and Woodmont, right in front of TD Bank that we identified that was just fixed. It was a tiered sidewalk that would have caused a serious safety issue that was just uh, just fixed by State Highway Administration, which we're really happy about. In fact, I noticed it, that it was finished by walking it myself, because I live uh, right down the road from that and was heading to a meeting from my home. But we need to do better. And, you know, the challenge that we have is working with State Highway. We need more of an urban road code. One of the challenges is we have an engineering standard for pedestrians and for roads that is based off of a state standard that's based off a federal standard. And effectively, that means that US 50 and Wisconsin and Connecticut and Old Georgetown Road and all the other state roads in Montgomery County and in District 1 are treated the same. And the reality is nobody is crossing US 50 by and large, to get a cup of coffee or to go to the gym or to drop their kid off at school. But they are across Wisconsin Avenue. They are across Old Georgetown Road. Uh, my sister-in-law lives directly across the street from Greenwich Park. She doesn't go to that park because it's too dangerous to cross the street. She goes to a park that's 20-minute walk, 25-minute walk away. She's lucky, fortunately, that we have multiple parks in close proximity. But it's literally across the street, and she won't even go there because she has you know, a 14-month-old daughter and is afraid that while walking with the stroller that she's going to get hit by a car. And that is just an unacceptable situation, particularly as we're focused on creating an urban, livable, walkable, accessible community. You can't have a livable, walkable, accessible community unless it can be safely livable, safely walkable, and safely mm -hmm. accessible. And currently, uh, it's just not. One of the focuses that I had during the Veers Mill Quarter Master Plan which was my first master plan that I got to work on as a member of the Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee and as a county council member. Uh, it was really transportation focused and it was the first one as a county that we've done that's Vision Zero. So it took time. We've been talking about Vision Zero, but we had to adopt Vision Zero and then it took time. And so this was the first one that we did. And during that process, I talked specifically about the flawed way in which we view intersections. Currently, we view intersections as part of the subdivision staging policy as either failing or functioning based exclusively on the speed with which cars get through. So that means, as a practical matter, the intersection where there is a death, as long as cars move through quickly from a public policy perspective, our policies would say that that is a functioning intersection. Well, there is no such thing as a practical matter of a functioning intersection where people die in it, period. And so we have to change the policy. We have to change the way that we look at those things. Some of the challenge is State Highway Administration and working with them. I continue. I just had a long conversation with Greg Slater, the State Highway Administrator, on Friday about specific intersections in Bethesda uh, that we're working on together, and he's trying to be helpful uh, within their confines. But we need to change our policies at the county level as well, and that starts with adding a safety standard 
in addition to a, an efficiency standard, a throughput of car standard to determining a failing or a functioning intersection? I've asked this question before, and I've been told it's just not doable in Montgomery County, but I take it you were at Mako last week. I was. So you drove up and down Coastal Highway. They have lovely little, those lovely barriers down the median strip that prevent people from crossing in, in, in mid-block. Some of our pedestrian deaths have been people trying to race across the mid-block to get to a bus stop or just to take a quicker route than to walk half a mile down to a crosswalk or whatever. But I've asked about why doesn't Montgomery County do something like that, and I've been told it's just not something that Montgomery County would do. After seeing what Ocean City has done, is there anything about those barriers that makes sense for certain roads in Montgomery County? I'd have to look into it, and I think there's a certain you know, a certain aspect of that that we should probably look at. But the bottom line is pedestrians are like water. They go to the path of least resistance. And so the reason why a pedestrian is crossing in an unsafe area is because we have the crosswalk in the wrong place. So I'd be a little bit concerned about spending a significant amount of taxpayer money that could be spent on improving the flawed design of our crosswalks and could be used to be putting in signalized crosswalks to prevent people from crossing in an area that isn't right. It it can help at times, and there, there are certain points that make sense there, right? The crosswalk outside of Secrets in Ocean City, I, I got to say I have a little bit of experience of, you know, walking out of Secrets. Unfortunately, uh, it, I don't, but it, okay. Yeah, in, in Ocean City, it's a, it's a wonderful place, and I think that there is something to be said for that, and the reason why people and for what people are crossing in Ocean City in that intersection are probably a little bit different than a lot of the folks who are just trying to catch the bus or who are just trying to walk their kid to school, who are just trying to get home or get from their home to their work. But, you know, I'm open to it. It's not that I would close the door on it, but I think that the challenge that we face is reinforcing the idea that pedestrians are responsible for collisions. And I think we we get into that a lot, and I don't think that that's the reality. I think twofold. One is the pedestrians are usually, you know, crossing at the most efficient and effective place to cross. It just happens to not be where the crosswalk is, which largely means that the crosswalk was put in the wrong place, which was an engineering mistake. And everybody is responsible for, you know, as a shared user of the road. And so, you know, we could also be talking about distracted driving and you know, the challenge that we face of distracted driving. The last two pedestrian collisions in Bethesda on Wisconsin Avenue on Middleton were due to a distracted driver. I think that there's a lot of things that we can try to do to regulate decision-making of residents, but I think we'd be better off focusing our limited tax dollars on improving the design so they actually work and actually make people safer. I'm not going to argue with you, but my, when you look at the fence that's going down the middle of Coastal Highway, I can't imagine that Ocean City spent a lot of money on it. I actually I, heard I, it was much more expensive than you would think because if you – I actually walked it because I wanted to see how it was done. Right. And I felt it, and it's reinforced with steel beams deep into the sidewalk. They had to cut holes in the sidewalk every about, I don't know, 10 feet. And it's drilled down. So I think it's much more expensive than you would think. I, look, it's but like, how much is a hawk signal? How much is a I – mean, I'm, I'm not disagreeing that, but that, the hawk that, si- that, that, that it's a car problem, not a pedestrian problem. I'm just thinking that if you're going to have crosswalks, you're going to put them – I would argue you it's, should, it's you a should des- put, You should make it so that people actually use the crosswalk. It's, it's, a, design, it's a design problem. I, I, I see it as less of a car problem or a pedestrian problem and more of a design problem. We design the roads for the cars to go too fast. And we shouldn't be shocked that the cars are going fast. Let's not blame the driver for that. Let's not blame the pedestrian for that. Let's not blame the bicyclist for that. Let's blame ourselves for that. We need to get out of the idea of looking outward on every problem and look a little bit more inward on those problems. And this is on us as, pu- as public policymakers. We need to do a better job of engineering our roads and designing our roads for an outcome that we actually want, which is people being safe. I'm tired of going individuals. I'm tired of having to make statements about people who get hit and checking in on their welfare. This is just not a tenable situation. We've had basically a pedestrian and bicyclist death a month this year. Every two days, we have three collisions related to pedestrians and bicyclists. We know that if a car is going 40 miles per hour, the likelihood of survival of a bicyclist or pedestrian is extremely low. And so we need to bring the speed of cars down. We need to provide better signalized crosswalks. The most recent issues that we're facing had nothing to do with, you know, Jennifer DeMauro and and Jay Castle or the two Middleton collisions. The two Middleton collisions were because there wasn't a hawk signal that was in a crosswalk that was not adhered to by a car 
based on a distracted driver, most likely, is what the initial reports are. Jay Cassell had a traverse through a far too small sidewalk on his bike going to the pool at the YMCA that was far too close to the road. Actually, if you walk the sidewalk on Old Georgetown Road, I live on Old Georgetown Road, so I walk it all the time. I have two siblings that live on either side of Old Georgetown Road, so I walk to their houses and see my nieces and nephews all the time. It's actually tilted in towards the road. If you were to swerve out slightly to avoid an obstruction, we have hydrants, we have telephone poles in the way of that too small sidewalk, and people put, unfortunately, their trash and recycling. So we're getting a review of what can be done about some of those obstructions, but it is designed to dump you into the street. I mean, that's literally how the sidewalk is designed. And, and there, we could spend as much money as we want on the median. It wouldn't have solved that challenge. And with Jennifer Understood. tomorrow, it, you know, she was crossing where you're supposed to cross. The problem is there is a a slight yellow light that took a lot of time for people to advocate for. That The yellow light at the Bethesda trolley chair, by the way, that was placed there because there was a five-year-old that was killed about five years ago. A child, a small child who was crossing at the Bethesda trolley trail on Tuckerman Lane and was struck and killed because the cars, and we were there, I was at a an event advocating for changes with community members and advocates, and cars were flying by, even with a police cruiser that was blocking off one of the lanes flying through it with the flashing yellow light at the intersection. So I think the hawk signals do make a difference. You need to slow the traffic Mm -hmm. down. One last question I have to ask for the folks in the bucolic hills of Poolsville. What's the latest on the Poolsville High School? Interesting question. The county executive, to his credit, is working on it. Uh, He has instructed his top leadership from his different agencies to participate in meetings that I have participated in as well, along with my staff. Uh, And the school system has participated as well. The first aspect of this is seeing what happens with the school system, which we should be learning soon uh, in the next, I think, several weeks about what the school system's plans are. One of the challenges that we have is that the school system has moved away from the knock down a school, rebuild a new school plan by and large to doing more cosmetic changes and some structural changes, but doing renovations to try to save money. And that could be a challenge in Poolsville because in order to do the dual use, multi-use facility, you'd need to knock it down and rebuild with the exception of the technology part of the high school, which Mm -hmm. it could be connected to. It's built to be connected. So we need to wait and see. Uh, I think there's absolutely no doubt that Poolsville has been left behind. They have been the unfortunate consequence of well-meaning policy changes that had purposes to deal with some of the down-county enrollment challenges that we were struggling to keep up with. Uh, reflected in the fact that we don't get nearly enough money from the state for school enrollment, that we need to invest more in that. We need to fight to get more from the state. And hopeful in this you know, HB1, which we're told by the speaker is going to happen, that's going to infuse a significant amount of additional school construction dollars to places like Montgomery County, which would be a game changer for us. But I'm confident the stakeholders are meeting on a regular basis. They continue to push for this, and I'm confident that we'll be able to find a resolution that serves everybody's purpose. And I appreciate the fact that the community members, the elected leadership in Poolsville, the county executive and his agencies and the school system are all now meeting on a regular basis and having the seriousness that this conversation deserves. Okay. Thank you very much. We, this has been a far-reaching conversation this morning. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Friedson. This has been Montgomery Talks. I'm Doug Tolman, senior reporter at Montgomery Community Media, our engineer today with Carolyn Roskoskis. So have a good day. Join us next time. Mm-hmm.